and we are on we are live hello everyone carlos here uh welcome to another what's uh up in archaeology for the second of may uh today we're going to uh apart from revisiting uh neanderthals we are going to um some other news of other things that have been exciting in archaeology uh, i found this um, blog uh, just for today uh, as usual i'm going to share it i'm going to share it and uh, we have here uh, pages uh, fossil history um she must be a grad student of uh, paleoanthropology and um she's really excited about some of the things that have been founded been found i'm sorry and have been announced and so on and uh, she gets really excited well we do get excited sometimes we when something uh, in our field gets uh, uh, gets um updated uh, discovered uh, and so on and um last week it has been quite a, an, an amazing week uh, in for archaeology and anthropology and paleoanthropology so let's get to it uh, we have here uh skull oh by the way this um i've read it uh, it's okay it's nothing pulitzer prize winning it's uh, it's very good uh good succinct writing uh it says the essential and uh it's okay everyone should check it out and uh i've got the script the, uh, the link in the description so everyone knows that i provide my my uh my sources uh or else i wouldn't be a, a uh, an archaeologist and a scientist you need to cite your sources first one uh australopithecus australopithecus sebida uh, we finally placed her him it uh, this hominin in uh, in uh, in the family tree, and uh, I'm just going to uh, get out of here and bring up this one. Um, uh, of uh, the 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 hominin family tree, where our species came from. You have the early hominins down here, uh, the Sahelopanthrop Sahelopanthropus chadensis, the Oronin tugensis. And then we have Australopithecus. Um, better, it's bigger, so everyone can see better. Uh, I think that's a bit better. Uh, Australopithecus cadaba. These are the early hominins, and we have uh, Ardipithecus ramidus, etc. But we're more interested in this area here, the Australopithecines, which. Um, uh, we finally placed um, uh, we have Australopithecus amanensis. I've talked about these before, but now we finally placed Sabida in here in the uh, the, Australop the the grass soil, and you have the robust Australopithecines. The robust are the robustus, Bozii, Agabi, and uh, these are all Paranthropus and Anthrop Australop Australopithecus, uh, Aethiopticus, um, Africanus, Sabida. Uh, Afarensis, Platyops are all the early uh, Australopithecines which uh, supposedly Homo habilis uh, evolved from, possibly. It's still not settled so well. So this is where we finally placed Australopithecus sabida here in the gracile Australopithecines. Now going back to the original story. Um, Sabida was first announced, when she was first announced, uh, this species was hypothesized to possibly be ancestral to some branch of the genus Homo. A new study, which you can link to, I won't link to it now, uh, challenges this notion, uh, suggesting that many of the features uh, that appear Homo-like were actually the result of the fossil that, uh, being of the juvenile, approximately the age of a seventh grader. Uh, six years, five, six years, seven years, seven years, seven, ten, ten years old, seven to ten years old. Well, that's how old I was when I went to seventh grade. Uh, six, seven, no, early six, seven, eight, nine, eleven, eleven, twelve years old. 
more or less a 12 year old uh, while this question of Sabida's place in the family tree is not new the study is interesting because it takes us closer look at the how traits develop uh, develop in Australopiths as usually uh, to uh, ultimately settle the debate more fossils need to be found of course uh, what they mean is um, size of the skull, size of the brain cavity, uh, the teeth, primarily the teeth, the the angle of the uh, where the the um, where the spine joins up to the to the head to the skull. These are all the pros all the, the the characteristics that place these uh, hominins into the orders that they are placed in. Uh, the teeth will give you uh, the dietary uh, component, dietary component. Uh, also how the muscles, how they are attached to the head, we'll see, see if they are primarily uh, nut eaters, fruit eaters, of uh, her 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 herbivores, or are they also beginning to scavenge meat eaters, which will mean that the, the muscles that, the, that, that are connected to the skull that move the lower jaw um, will not need to be as strong. Uh, you can, I've shown you before uh, pictures of uh, Paranthropus bozii, the nutcracker man, uh, as he's been known. He has massive jaws and he has massive, had massive muscles connecting the jaw to the head, to the skull, to enable them to, to break down the uh, plant food that, that they ate. Um, so uh, he's been placed into a uh, into his um, his uh, the 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 Australopithecus, the gracile Australopithecines. What does gracile mean? Gracile means light. Uh, you have the massive, the the robust, which means that they were more massive. I'll give you an example. You look, you know how a gorilla is. He he's the grass, uh, the robust um, uh, hominid, because he's a hominid, not a hominin, but a hominid. Uh, well, he's a he's a an ape, our ape uh, cousin, and he would be the robust. Now you have the chimpanzees; they're smaller in stature and everything. They are the gracile. Can you see the analogy? I'm just making an analogy. It's not how they are related to each other in any way. So you can so you guys can look at modern day examples. We technically are gracile. Uh, as well, even though we sort of are in between the um, the uh, robust, the massive ones, and the more lighter ones, but yeah, we can have the um, an example of our our most gracile forms would be the the San people of uh, Kalahari of the South Southern Africa, compared to the uh, the Nordic tribes and the Nordic peoples. It is just a north-south divide easily. We can you also have them in in the in each of the each of the geographical areas of Asia. Uh, you have, uh, for example, closer to the equator, they seem to be more gracile, uh, even in, in form. While the the northern you go there because it's colder, you need to be become more more uh, uh, reduce your surface area by becoming bigger. That's why. So uh, the San S A N uh, carp merchant, uh, the ones that click when they talk, the those ones. Uh, the gods were cr or must be crazy movie. The the San. That's how you sort of pronounce their people. Okay, back to the uh, the story. The next one. I've talked last week about uh, Homer and a lady. A lady. Uh, he's a uh, the hominin. I'll bring back where he's uh, that uh, other. Um, uh, the other uh, 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 image of, of our family tree and uh, Homo Noledi is here you can see it, this area here uh, I can't magnify it anymore sorry about that 500 can't go anymore. It's 500 it's at the maximum magnification the Kuisan yeah there are more there are more than just one the San people there are three actually the Khoisan are one of them and you have other ones I can't remember them now but uh, they are just an example that I gave I'll I'll talk about them in the future uh, Philip Daniel right the the, the Homo lady uh, would fit more or less here he would be um, 
possible. He was contemporary, contemporaneous with uh, Homo erectus. And for what we found, this is why it's uh, exciting, at least for our archaeologists and anthropologists. Um, uh, when did he live? Right, we know that he was contemporary, contemporary because of many of these features with Homo erectus, uh, one point one one point one million years ago in Africa. But they've dated him. This was an individual. This this uh, small group of hominins are uh, very very unique because they were found inside a cave. Uh, I talked about it last week where they were deliberately buried. Um, and uh, to get to the the end of the cave where they were where they were uh, deposited, it's it wasn't easy. You had to crawl through spaces which were very small. They were deliberately buried there. Well, the size of their their brain cavity I've talked about last week were not that much bigger than chimpanzees, and uh, they had, uh, but their brain structure was almost like a miniature homo sapiens or miniature yeah miniature homo sapiens or homo erectus at least more homo sapiens do you know why because apart from them living about two hundred thousand years ago when they last died out so they were contemporary with our direct ancestor the homo uh, uh, homo sapiens ancestor which was also the ancestor of Neanderthals and and also possibly Denisovians, but this guy uh, has been found. Let's see if it's here. Yeah, here we go. Uh, number two, he could possibly talk. Here is a scan of uh, inside what is brain the of his brain cavity they made a they made a, a cast of the inside of his the skull which gives structures of how the brain was and uh, though because it's sort of uh it's easy, it's a, a technique that's used in easily used in uh, in all fields of anthropology and archaeology and paleoanthropology uh, the the brain uh it leaves an impression is uh, inside the inside part of the skull, so we can then infer certain structures. And the most interesting one is if you can see this arrow here, this part, the frontal lobe of the brain, it is uh, very very close to what ours is. Um, uh, the thing here just be just broke the new, another study of the surface to examine the brains of these interesting hominins. Scientists looked at the endocast, that means the inside part of the cast, the imprint of the brain on the skull, to try and learn more about the parts, which parts were developed and which weren't. Their findings, though the brain is small, it is organized in an advanced manner, much like modern humans. Most surprisingly, the lady had may have had the ability to speak. Uh, suggested from the development of certain parts of the frontal lobe, which is where the arrow is pointing, this part here. So they may have had a communi may have communicated um, uh, in a more advanced way than than uh, contemporary uh, hominins, namely uh, Homo erectus, end of the end, uh, with the, the first, uh, then ancestor Homo sapiens. Uh, which gave rise to uh, the Neanderthals and us and the, and the Denisovians and the other fourth species that we don't uh, fourth uh, cousin that we don't know about yet. We only know about the Andaman Islands having the, its DNA. Um, this could be mean that speech in in uh, our lineage, the Homo lineage, uh, came on early. So uh, it's very exciting news. Um, something a bit di different. Homo floresiensis, or the, if you guys know the Hobbit, that was discovered in the island of Flores. Well, it, it's been nicknamed the Hobbit. These small hominins, uh, they were stood about a meter and a bit tall. Um, they were found on the island of, of uh, Flores in Indonesia, and uh, they are they were small. And they studied them. They first thought that they may have descended from uh, uh, Homo erectus and some even thought that they may have been just uh, uh, microcephalitic human beings that because interbreeding and some made them small and that uh, modern humans I mean not human beings modern humans us but no they found that uh, 
they are not uh, related to Homo erectus. They, um, the new studies refutes that idea, suggesting instead that the hobbits, I hate this fucking name, they should stop using this name, uh, descended from a hominin, uh, more primitive than erectus. Uh, but who? Um, they don't know which, of course, but it may have been a creature similar to Homo habilis. This, this, uh, is um, significant in many ways. First, uh, it's uh, evidence of a, of a hominin that left Africa uh, about the same time as Homo erectus, 1.2 million years ago, 1 million years ago. Um, it's exciting, just would have been that not just one hominin left Africa that early, and there must have been another one. Um, from Africa, getting to uh, the island of Flores, uh, it, it was that island has always been isolated. So they would have need to have developed watercraft, boats, rafts, whatever. Uh, the implications are quite, are quite uh, mind boggling. Uh, for a species supposedly that primitive, Firstly, getting there, and we haven't found any evidence of, of its descendants in, it, in the journey. We don't know which way it came, if it came through the southern route uh, across uh, along the coast, or if it crossed India into uh, Southeast Asia and then into Indonesia, or if it came above, because these are the three routes that physically had to do. Remember, there are the Himalayas that are the barrier. So... Uh, geographically, you have to look at that, and uh, that's not just a little barrier. That's a fucking great wall. Um, so this, uh, the Homo florin floriensis, Flores floresiensis, is just blowing anthropology and archaeology to smithereens and paleoanthropology, and even biology. Shit, uh, it's just whoa. Well, even I'm sometimes. Um, flabbergasted or uh, really blown away. Um, going back to the, it's the study, it's extraordinarily comprehensive. The, re the researchers examined 133 cranial, skeletal, and dental samples and a variety of modern and ancient species to compare in Af Af Asia, Africa, and Europe. And uh, the, 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 the blocks don't match. So that's um, uh, something. We're just scratching the surface. You know, I don't. Know. We need to to get more studies, more excavations, because in, in I'm sure in India, due to many uh, volcanic eruptions about a million years ago, uh, possibly has a countless number of of um, countless sites buried and countless fossils buried in that volcanic. Uh, debris that that's just perfect for dating. Um, uh, we did four Homo naledi, we did three Homo florences, we did the skull, and now we go on to number one, which is basically what I think about Homo um, uh, Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis, Homo sapiens. Uh, the name's still not settled, but we'll call him Denisovian for now. Um, Many, uh, some uh, excavations in some caves, they've, they've been, because an archaeologist is not just going to a cave and just dig and throw away the dirt. No, they, they collect samples. Um, the, the samples are uh, not just for the archaeologists, for their for the geographers, the geologists, the botanists, the uh, climatologists, the environmental scientists, because you need to uh, build up uh, the, the, um, the, the setting, excuse me, the setting of and the time of that uh, location of the, you need to get context, basically. Uh, just if you take a, a fragment of of, a, of, um, of of a fossil out of the context, it is worthless. You can't do anything about it. Just it's just a normal bone, even though you can extract the DNA for it. But that's just what it's worth. But if you study where it's located in, in a three-dimensional space, obviously. 
of the cave setting or the ground setting or the wherever wherever it was found, and everything that it that's in it, the dirt, the rocks, um, the bones, the charcoal for fire, etc. That gives you the context. Now they've been doing. Uh, 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 taking samples wherever they uh, have been ex excavating and new techniques allows us which I'll read this um, not so long ago uh, no one knew if DNA could survive after an organism died then a field of ancient archaeology of DNA was born and scientists began to discover and interpret DNA from long dead creatures like the Neanderthal um, the furthest uh, they've been able to extract a viable DNA so far has been the the Neanderthals and the Denisovians, sixty-ish thousand years ago. So we'll settle that. They are trying to bring it back further. Yes, they have extracted um, DNA from amber. Uh, insects and other animals in amber but that is a super super exceptional preservation i've talked about how fossils are formed you go back more to my video two or two three weeks four weeks ago uh, how fossils are formed and you'll see how difficult it is to uh to make to um uh, preserve any living matter if the conditions are not right so here um they've now the field has taken yet another giant leap forward recovering dna not from the bones themselves but from random dirt left behind scientists announced last week and that's this this last week that they were able to find and identify genetic traces of both neanderthals and denisovians in cave settlements likely the result of these hominins once defecating or like or other leaving other genetic marker so they've been extracting the dna from the shit vomit uh injury blood because hunting you can get injured and so on lots of ways that uh you can leave your dna's behind um yeah he said she says let me repeat the craziest part of it they discovered dna without discovering bones from the shit, from the, 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 the poo, if you don't want to go into those things. Um, now we can learn that Neanderthals visited particular caves, even if they, they couldn't find their bones or stone tools. If a bit like discover, It's a bit like discovering that you can extract gold dust from the air. Well, this is a fucking stupid analogy, but she's excited. The person's excited to write this. I'll, I'll give it a, some, credit, some uh, leeway. Uh, population geneticist Adam Spill commented, a sediment that captures an incredible nature of, of this find. Yeah, this guy got a bit over overexcited, not the, the author of the blog. Sorry, I apologize. Um, what's her name? Um, I apologize. Paige, sorry about that. Um, uh, where was I? Yes, uh, the sediment that captures in criminal nature. Uh, this will likely lead to find further interesting discoveries. For example, as Chris Stringer pointed out, he's an anthropologist, uh, the technique could reveal the existence of other uh, ancient hominin species, ones that we don't even know about yet. Yes, the uh, one that the Andaman Islanders DNA has, and he's different from Homo sapiens. It's different from Homo sapiens, Neanderthal, Denisovians. He's a fourth cousin of ours. And why is he a cousin of ours? He is a race, an actual human race. The four, so far, four human races. Homo sapiens, sapiens, Homo sapiens, Neanderthalensis, Homo sapiens, Denisovians, and the Andaman Island, the DNA that we don't have named him yet because he's so, f just the DNA we have only left of him. They are four of human races, not what we have now what we have now in earth and i'll reiterate this until the end of the earth we are one human race all the colors of the rainbow are just normal variations of one race homo sapiens sapiens okay uh we end this here and just a little bit of a bonus we'll continue down here um they have found that 
uh, this is sort of a, a bomb, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to debunk this as much as I possible. This is where I'm trying to debunk. Normally, I just comment on my, on my uh, videos, but this one I'm going to debunk a little bit. Um, just sweating my whistle, bit of beer. Oh shit! Uh, yeah, the fr the beer froth almost got like, got 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 away from me. Anyway, um, last week a claim of evidence of human presence in California or 130,000 years ago. Uh, the news came out. I'll will just look up the uh, show you the articles. Um, uh, here we go. One's from New York Times, and the other one's from National Geographic. Uh, but looking up the New York Times one um, from this um, uh, side view of the groove produced by a uh, mastodon uh, bone bone. There's a groove here. Yes, I think. Uh, prehistoric humans, perhaps Neanderthals or other lost species, occupied what is now California some 130,000 years ago. A team of scientists reported on Wednesday, Wednesday last. Uh, this, the bold and fiercely disputed claim, published in the journal Nature, and I uh, suggest uh, see. I'll open it up. See what's what does it say? Because this is the actual call, the actual study, and uh, we'll read about it from here. So. This is a study, the study, actual study article. Of course, it's only the first part, but um, the earliest dispersals of, uh, but that's for now what's all you can get because uh, it's under a paywall and I'm not going to pay to get it, but that's okay. Anyway, uh, this is the synopsis of the article. Uh, the earliest dispersal of humans into North Africa, uh, North America is a contentious subject, and proposed earlier sites are required to meet the following criteria of acceptance. One, the archaeological evidence is found in a clearly defined and undisturbed geological context. Like I said, I talked about context before. Uh, you can't get a bone, a fragment of a bone or uh, whatever, uh, isolated. That's no context there. They're basically worthless, useless. Uh, the age is determined by reliable geometric dating. Obviously, got to date the, the actual fossil and the surrounding context, which was found. The matrix that we, it was found. The matrix, the soil, the the, the the deposit, the layer. Right. You don't just date one thing. You have to date the whole to get a range to get a, 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 a calibrated or a confirmed dating. Because sometimes in sites, rabbits and other rodents, and I said, mix up the. Uh, the, the mix up the deposit and uh, he, he just jumbles the the, the, um, the stratigraphic layers layerings that can date um, the uh, the artifacts and the site and the uh, the layer um, then you get multiple lines of evidence from the inter interdisciplinary studies providing consistent results right you need to study them peer review them get everything uh, 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 falsifiable, unfalsifiable, and falsifiable data. It has to be uh, peer reviewed. It has to be confirmed, independently confirmed. In fact, um, then an unquestionable artifact, uh, uh, unquestionable artifacts are found in a primary context. That means on situ. They've never been disturbed. Uh, so here we uh, we describe the uh, Seruti Mastodon uh, site, an archaeological site from the early late Pleistocene period epoch prior to 130,000 years, where in situ hammerstones and other small uh, stone anvils occupy a, a spatial temporal association with fragmentary remains of a single mastodon, the American uh, mammoth. Uh, the CM site contains spir spiral fracture bones and molar fragments, indicating that breakage occurs while fresh. Several of these fragments also preserve evidence of percussion. The occurrence of, of a distribution of bone, molar and stone uh, refit suggested the breakage occurred at the site of, of burial. Uh, five large cobbles, hammerstones, and anvils in the CM, the CM, that's a serity muscle, uh, bone bed display use wear and impact marks, and they are hydraulically anomalous relative to low energy contacts of an enclosing sand silt stratum. Uh, this means that 
the weather was located sandy, uh, and it would, is not the sandy deposit or how were that were deposit that might that caused the, the the markings of the of the the artifacts that I found. That I've dated it uh, with thorium uranium radiometric analysis because it's over seventy thousand years ago old. You can't date with radiocarbon. You have to use other methods, and they used thorium uranium radiometric analysis of the multiple bones specimens using diffusion absorption decay. Uh, dating models indicating a, uh, a burial date of 130,000 points, 130.7 plus or minus 9.4 thousand years ago. So the 9.4, 10,000 plus or minus the age, a difference of 130. It can be 140 to 120. Uh, between 120 and 140,000 years ago, that, that dating method told us. Uh, these findings confirm a presence of an unidentified species of Homo in the CM site uh, during the last interglacial period. Um, early late Pleistocene indicated that humans with manual dexterity and the experimental knowledge to use hammer stones and anvils processed mastodon limb bones for marrow extraction and or raw materials for bone production. Systematic proboscean Proboscis, the animal, the, the mastodon, uh, bone reduction evident in the CM site fits within a broader pattern of Paleolithic bone percussion technology in Africa, Eurasia, North America. I mean, the way that they were broken up, they fit the same uh, as other sites in, in the world, in Africa, Eurasia, North America, etc. So um, this is interesting, and I will try to dispute it uh, using my limited resources because I don't have, uh, uh, first, I don't have a library that they have. I don't have a, a laboratory and I don't have anyone around me, but I will use my intuition of what I've learned and I'll just try to dispute it. Uh, why I don't think this is correct. Now, um, before that, I'm going to play a video. Uh, and I will be using, shit, I will be using WikiLeaks. I know it's, oh God, WikiLeaks is, um, it's a start, but bear in mind, I will, during the week, post the more uh, more um, reliable sources for what I'm going to do now. But before that, I'm going to treat you guys to a video. And uh, here we go. This is how uh, Beringia was formed. So um, over 20,000, from 21,000 years ago, the raising of the ending of the Ice Age, the sea level changes happened here this is just enjoy the video you got 16,000 years the depth of the uh, the shrinking of the Beringia this was the landmass of Beringia now it's shrinking from uh, Asia or uh, Russia and Alaska and we get to the present and that's how the that part of the world looks like And we're ending today. That's how it is. Uh, this is interesting. You saw that 22,000 years ago is when the sea level started to rise, when the end of the last glaciation. Now, oh, God, I'm going to bring up... Uh, just stop sharing for a sec. I'm going to bring up um, WikiLeaks because it's got a date there that I, uh, uh, that I like. Um... I'll share again. Um, Brickyleaks. What's interesting here is this part of Beringia, Beringia landmass. It's from the wiki of Beringia. Uh, during the, this is the most interesting part about this uh, this uh, section here. During the Pleistocene epoch, which is the time that they were talking about for that. Uh, Mastodon site, the that kill that kill site, or at least a butchering site. Uh, the global cooling led periodically to the expansion of glaciers and lowering of sea levels. This created land connections in various regions of the globe. Today, the average water depth of the Bering Strait, which divides Siberia from Alaska, is about 40 to 50 meters, 130 to 160 feet. Therefore, the land bridge opened up when the sea level dropped be below the 50 meter mark. The 160 feet, below what it is now. A reconstruction of the sea level history of the region indicated that there was a seaway 
that existed there from 135,000 to 70,000 before the present. Right when that hominin, homo, that human ancestor, human, um, was supposed to have been in California. Um, uh, the implications were that they would have had to cross over before about 200,000 years ago or earlier. We know that they were there were hominins in that area. Homo erectus was there for, for 700,000 years ago in uh, Chukutian in China, a cave of Chukutian picking man. Java man, 500, 400, 500,000 years ago in, in the Indonesia, Java. Uh, so there were hominins. Uh, living in that part of Asia. Now, um, did any of those uh, ancestral species, uh, Homo erectus, cross over to the Americans, to the Americas, using the l a land bridge prior to 135,000 years ago, uh, when there was uh, another land bridge possibly before it got covered and became an, a, a, a seaway? That is something that will need to be obviously studied, and they need to find more evidence because it's, because I've always said it's just not it's not just from one uh, site that you can make an, uh, uh, a picture. Uh, uh, the Nizovian, uh, the Nizovians have only been found physically in one cave in Siberia, uh, we, but we have found that the, it's his DNA spread in a variety of areas in there from the americas to australia and asia uh, to a certain percent of the population not all of course not all because uh, there were many many waves of uh, of uh, quote unquote migration routes into that area from homo sapiens from neanderthals from denisovians from the other fourth unknown um uh race of humans and now we have this one that sort of uh, not throws a spanner into the works because uh, we are we are we are uh, anthropologists, archaeologists, etc. Uh, it's exciting, but it, it just it's the exception that we like to look at. We uh, that's why it why is it, it's exciting. So it would have to have uh, crossed before the 135,000 years ago, and when the land then the land bridge opened up again in 70,000, 60,000 more or less with intermittent connections 60 to 35,000 and then again 30 to 11,000 BP before the present. The 30 to 1,000, 30,000 to 1,000 BP is when the American natives, American, the Amerindians is the correct term, crossed into uh, America from Asia. Genetically they are the correct in that, in their, in that period. And uh, even uh, genophobically, how they look, you can see that they uh, that they sort of resemble Asian because they have the uh, some sort of uh, uh, corresponding characteristics. So that's my small reputation refutation. Uh, I'm going to try and because these uh, uh, sources like this one uh, from uh, NGOs to uh, it's behind a fucking paywall. And this one, uh, also, these are behind paywalls. I want to try and find um, uh, articles, not just newspaper articles. I want to try and find actual studies, like I showed you one from uh, from before. From uh, oh, what the one that I opened up before? From this one, from Nature. This is also from Makanani's read the. I want to get something like this so I can put in the description, and uh, that's why I don't. Which why I'm still skept. Which why I'm skeptical. I'm questioning until more evidence occur appears, uh, uh, independent analysis, etc., from other sites. So we end uh, this one, and now uh, just to uh, I got well, still got. A few minutes to uh, 20 minutes to, to talk about. So, I'm going to talk about um, something which I like uh, supra orbital toruses. What are they? Uh, let me just make it big so everyone can have a look. What are 
those the supra orbital toruses. Uh, they are brow ridges. Oh shit, they went too much now. Not too much. Uh, just drop. yeah, here we go. They are the brow ridges. Uh, we Homo sapiens don't have brow ridges. Uh, well, we have very, 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 very small ones. If you can pass your hand, your hands on top of your your eyebrows, where your eyebrows are, a little bit of an experiment, um, you can see that um, we have a very, very small uh, brow ridges. And uh, what are they there for? Also, uh, let's have a read. Supraorbital torus, or brow ridges, is a very distinctive morphological trait in most of our hominin ancestors. Uh, what the purpose of these features serve? There are a few theories around. One of them is the dissipation of chewing force produced by the jaw muscles and transmitted around the nose and the eye socket. Um, if you put your hands on your chins where the cheekbones are, you can see the muscles that are that are powering your your uh, mandible, your lower jaw, when you chew. That's what they mean here. Then. It's the reinforcement of the frontal bone, which has which was weaker in all the hominin species before Homo sapiens. This is similar idea to uh, to explain the development of the chin in modern humans. It's a reinforcement for the weaker jaw, which is oddly enough that uh, Paranthropus bozii, the actual nutcracker man, which this uh, it's a bit two hundred, which this um, blog. Uh, site is named but it's Spanish, so um, it's called the Nutcracker Man because of uh, uh, Bozio and uh, also because of uh, ancestral Homo sapiens, uh, the ancestor Hodel begins his more or less. Um, it's a protection of the skull and the eyes against blows, uh, it's a signaling effect, accentuating aggressive stares, thus, a larger size could have been a sexually selective through generations yes um chimpanzees and baboons if you see how they use their eye uh, brow movements to uh show uh, aggression etc that's a good theory yeah however many huge super supra orbital tori that's plural for taurus just say that I'm a, I'm a nerd are hollowed inside with uh, large sinuses for example the petrolona which suggests that they did not bear or transmit physical forces from blows to the head or the chewing or to heavy chewing. I like to think, uh, this is opinion, that these are a combination of several factors which made evolution work for a few million years. Uh, this post describes the suborbital tori of 22 iconic hominins. We have the australopithecines. Uh, all 444.2, the largest australopithecine afarensis skull yet discovered. That's the, that's the, it's, um, uh, it's um, designation, uh, the actual um, example you can see here below, the center one, AL4442, AL this one, um, had an extensive suborbital torus, thickened laterally and continues su su superiorly posturally with no interruption. So it continued all around his eye. Uh, ST STS-5, uh, Mrs. Plez, uh, STS-5, which is this this one, no, the center one, STS-5, center, left, right, yeah, this one, uh, STS-5, uh, has a relatively small suborbital uh, brow ridges, if I forget, uh, double ice in the front and projecting uh, glabella, another one, Africanus, which is STS-71, which is on the right, which is this one here. Uh, he has a less broad torus compared to STS, STS-5, but similar to the, it has similar expanded glabella. That's this part here. This is the extended glabella that he's talking about. This is, uh, if you guys can see where, the, where my cursor is, uh, the brow ridge is here. The glabella is this part here. So, so just so you know. Then we got to Homo erectus and Ergaster. Uh, they also had prominent brow ridges. Um, Tukana, man, Tukana boy. Um, one's a female, one's a male. Uh, the they have a differential morphological difference between the female and the male. 
one's smaller than the males have a bigger one and the females slightly smaller it's dimorphism in action uh, our species uh, homo sapiens sapiens have also have displaced sexual dimorphism the males are bigger than the females naturally uh in generally um Basically, that uh, each one has its 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 its, uh, its, its, its feature, uh, the Homo erectus and uh, her ga agaster. Um, Homo another the Eurasian Homo erectus, which is different from the African Homo erectus, apparently, especially the the uh, the Manizi, Manizi uh, um, uh, skulls that they found. They are way um, bigger. They have really expanded. At the brow, uh, brow ridges from the fossils that they found. Um, another one's here from uh, uh, from left to right. Have the the Manizi. Oh shit! Sorry about that. Here we go. Manizi. I get back to that shit. Oh, but, oh, I opened to, to another one. Sorry about that. <laughs> I opened to a new window. Uh, the Manizi is this one, the one on the left. Uh, five. Uh, Saiyan Sang Sangiran 17. Peking Man. These are the ones here. Uh, then you got the Middle Pleistocene, which are the uh, um, earlier than, than those. Soprano Skull. In Europe, each ones are getting smaller and smaller as we uh, we get to modern humans. So, until we, uh, our species have them almost disappeared, um, I think I'll end it here uh, before I become too boring. And um, uh, I want to ask you guys uh, one thing. I know there's only six watching, but uh, you guys are sort of my my friends and um i always like to hear your opinion um should i do a question and answer uh a stream on archaeology and try and answer as as well as i can uh like many people have done they i talk i, I watch what you guys post in the in the uh comment section uh, here in the the chat and uh, I'll have to stop and, and answer them as much as I can. What do you guys think? While I have a beer, you guys can mull that over. You're probably just listening to it now. Yes, Crazy Cat, of course it could, because all the features that, that can be... Um, that can that are uh, that uh, can be uh, selected for could be uh, one of the prime movers of this is almost a practice run to the question and, and answer the um, the one of the the, um, the prominent prime mover in in evolution is sexual selection every species does it we don't uh, all 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 life selects the best uh, most um, most uh, fit individual to individuals to try and uh, and um, pass on the genes for the most successful uh, the, the greatest success of the species or or group or whatever so um, yes uh, the disappearance of the brow ridge in homo sapiens could have been sexually um, uh, influenced so yes uh, baboons uh, especially the highland baboons from Ethiopia. I don't know. They have a specific name which I can't think of. It now they they're primarily vegetarians. They are the most beautiful ones. They have this beautiful. I think you guys know what I mean from National Geographic and and BBC Life Wildlife and that. They have this beautiful coat. They're so and they have one male that controls. You can see that baboons, even though they're they're uh, primates, they fucking have canine teeth bigger than that, as big as uh of, as uh, uh, the predators and um 
Uh, no, it's not so, uh, sexually problematic because that's the way you pass your genes. If you don't have sex and you pass on your genes through uh, mating, you, you, you the line ends. So it's not problematic. It's it's one of the prime movers. Uh, it's just basic natural selection. Uh, Malachite. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is crazy cat, gentlemen. <laughs> oh, God, yes, it is. In modern times, it is fucking uh, everything is. Uh, you forgot some letters, man. Jesus. You have to put the the uh, Latin alphabet, the Chinese alphabet, the Japanese alphabet, the uh, uh, um, all the alphabets of the world before we get to uh, that. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, guys, I'm cutting it short tonight. Um, <laughs> LGBT, JPEG, GIMP, 4GIF. Yep, 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 that's about it. Yep, yep. <laughs> oh, God, that's fucking funny. Thanks, guys. Um, pa uh, genes passed by other means. Biology is what... Uh, yes, it is, exactly. Blowjobs and, and, uh, and uh, anal sex, they pass on genes. <laughs> But only on one sided, though. <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks for coming along. I'm going to end it here. I'm going to see what other streams are on. Um, uh, guys, I honestly, I, I, I'm not making it. I'll, I'll post some um, links uh, in the description as well for next week's show. If you guys want um, a question and answer sec sec session, I will uh, try and uh, publicize it all, all week, do some reading up. And um, just a refresher, because I know I'll be expecting some really fucking tough questions, but I lift for those. I uh, just will need to have two beers to jog my memory then. So, guys, thank you for coming on. Uh, I love you all. Uh, no homo, though, but uh, nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean. You know, you know me. So uh, see you next week, guys, and thanks a lot. Bye-bye.